Welcome back to another interview of Room for Discussion. Today, our guest is Tom Standage, the deputy editor of The Economist. We'll be talking about algorithms, social media bubbles, and the Trump Twitter ban, as well as technology in the 21st century at large. Thanks for taking the time today with us, uh, Mr. Standage. Hello, good to be here. Yeah, how are you? Good, thank you. Yeah? Good, thank you. Hello from London. Yeah. <laughs> a lockdown London, yeah. Well, hello yeah. from a curfew-ridden, riot-infested Amsterdam. Yeah, so I hear. You've had riots, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, crazy. yeah. In, in uh, the street, actually. Yeah, so. they were in the street mm. as well, yeah. Right. Um, okay, so first thing we're going to talk about is The Economist, naturally, and some of its different kind of products. Um, you've talked before about how The Economist sells this feeling of, of being informed, like an antidote to, to information overload. Yeah, I think, you know, when we read The Economist or try to read it from front to, to back, there's so much information in there. Is it intentionally so comprehensive? Is that what you try and do? Yeah, it is meant to be comprehensive in the sense that what we're what we're offering is sort of if you read one thing a week, if you're on a desert island and you've only got one thing, then read this and we'll kind of cover all the stuff you really need to know. Um, that said, we don't really expect everyone to read every word. So we do expect you to go through it and sort of decide whether to read each piece or not. Um, and if you do that, and a lot of people have a ritual where they read for sort of, you know, two hours on a on a Saturday morning or something like that. Um, if you do that and um, and you get to the end, then you do kind of feel like you've been subjected to an awful lot of different ideas and a lot of different, um, you know, you've learned about a lot of things from a lot of parts of the world. And it does give you a sense of sort of being on top of things. And ultimately, I think that's the feeling that we're selling, which is which is sort of, OK, I've caught up. And now I've got permission to go and do something else. And that's a feeling you never get from the Internet or you never get from, say, the New York Times. I mean, I love the New York Times and I subscribe to the New York Times or the Washington Post, say. But they're producing, you know, two or three hundred pieces a day. I think there's no way any human can read them all. So you never get to the end and you never feel like you've got to the end. There's always another piece you could read. And what we're trying to do is give you a much more finite bundle that you can plausibly um, scan most of and you know some people do actually try and read all of it but um do you but read there all is, of yes, and, and, the, and then each piece itself is very very dense as well it gives you a lot of information it sort of cuts to the chase tells you what you need to know quickly um so yes the idea is to is to be a antidote to the the feeling of never being able being overwhelmed never kind of catching up with the news and to give you that feeling that you have caught up do you read the, the economist from back to back every week I don't read it from front to back. I mean, I read it in kind of a weird order during the week because I may have been asked to edit. Ah, so okay. this morning, for example, we've just put this week's issue to bed and I got up at quarter to seven my time. And there's this process where we're we're basically all reading all the pages. Um, there's four senior editors. So the editor, the deputy editor, and then two senior editors who read as um, between them. Um, someone at least reads uh, every page again once. Um, so I've just read about... Um, a third of all of the pages because some of the some of the pages get read by two people and some of them don't go through this process but i've just read about a third of all the pages in this week's issue on a wide range of subjects um and in some cases i'd seen those stories in earlier forms um so i haven't read the whole thing quite yet and there will be some pieces that i do go and read you know later on today or tomorrow on the web or in the print edition or in the app or whatever yeah. um so so this week i've read quite kind of quite a large chunk of it um, and most weeks, whoever's sitting in the editor chair, the editor's chair will have read not quite every word, but nearly everything. Um, so, yeah, that is um, I, I, it can be done, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but we don't really expect readers to do that. OK, uh, you must be awfully or like incredibly informed if you read all of that. We, we never managed to do it, but we do know the Espresso app, um, right. which is a, another product of The Economist, which like provides the news in a very, um, yeah condensed form yeah uh, does this is this product intended as to prevent information overload um the, what the, the idea with espresso was that um was that we wanted to make a smartphone product and we wanted something that was a daily product and uh, you know now there are lots of daily newsletters and so on but this was just when the current newsletter boom was getting going and we were worried that um people would be reading other publications every day and they would you know they would forget about the economist arriving once a week and we were publishing things on the web but we didn't have a a sort of weekly cadence a thing that came sorry a daily cadence a thing that came to you every day um so espresso was started to be a dose of the economist every day and to try to do what the weekly does once a week 
once a day, which is to kind of make you feel like you've caught up and give you some interesting ideas and some some hints, some clues about what might be coming later in the day. So Espresso gives you that. It gives you the roundup of kind of basically here's the news that happened since yesterday. Um, and in, in, it's in seven 50 word little gobbets. And then uh, it has five pieces about, you know, here's stuff that's on the agenda for the world today. Um, and it's sort of trying to give you a sneak preview of the, and it's, so it, and it's called Espresso because it's this very concentrated dose of information. Yeah. And the idea with the articles, which are no more than 150 words long, is that they should fit on the screen of a smartphone. Um, so we wanted to make a, a, a product that was meant to be read uh, on smartphones. And it launched around the same time as the New York Times Now mm -hmm. app, which was the New York Times version of, of let's make a smartphone product. And what the New York Times did was they said, well, look, we publish 200 articles a day or whatever it is that are typically a thousand words long. That's more than any human can read. So why don't we just put 30 of them into an app? Then we've got a smartphone product, but they were still a thousand words long, <laughs> these pieces. There's still more than most. I mean, that's, that's getting on for half an edition of The Economist. Um, and that product failed. And I think it, part of the reason why it failed was that it didn't recognize that, um, you know, you do have to, you, people do have different needs when they're reading on different platforms in different ways at different times of the day. And if you want to make a, a product that people will, no, the New York Times has since discovered and produced an absolutely fantastic daily product in the form of its daily podcast. And its morning newsletter is very good too. And, you know, that's much closer to the kind of territory that, that, that uh, Espresso is in. Um, but anyway, that was the main idea. Was it was if we were making this a smartphone native product, what would it look like? And yeah. um, and that was that was kind of what I what I thought it should look like. But and I seems... I prototyped it in fact when it originally it was my idea, and I kind of mocked it up on a smartphone and took it to people and said, "What about this?" And they said, "That's great, let's launch it." And I said, "No, no this is a totally fake product. This is just <laughs> a, a prototype on a phone. It's not actually real." And then then we had to build it. Okay. Because it seems like a complementary good, right? Instead of a supplementary good. But yeah, no, it, it is totally. And and um and the idea is that it allows us to maintain our relationship with economist subscribers during the week and sort of stay front of mind. Uh, and they've had an economist experience every day, and then the weekly shows up. And then the other thing is our app um uh now does a much better job, I think, of sort of spreading the 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 enormous pile of stuff that arrives once a week, spreading it out through the week. Um, so if you go to the app every day, there's a selection of stories that are sort of most relevant for that day or that we think are important that week and you should read. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the main thing is that you know, there's no correct way to read The Economist. And our approach has always been to try and meet people where they are and help them, you know, allow them to consume the content in the form they most want to. So we have the audio edition as well, which is where news readers read out every story. Um, and we've been doing that for oh, 12 years, for 15 years now. Um, and you know it's a massive undertaking. They'll be recording it right now uh, on Thursday morning because that, that has to be ready by Thursday evening. And we've only just closed all the pages. Uh, so we've got the audio edition, we've got podcasts, we've got the weekly, we've got the app, we've got newsletters, we've got espresso. And you know how you mix those and fit them into your diet and your media consumption is up to you. But we want to kind of give you all those options. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, one thing the Economist does, which is pretty unique, I'd say, and pretty interesting, is is not having links in your articles. And so this definitely leaves the reader feeling more satisfied, right? They don't get into that rabbit hole of link have, after link. And I've, I've defended that position for quite a while. And some people say, well, uh, well, um, it shows that, you know, the economist is sort of dinosaur-like and refuses to come into the age of the web. But I, I personally, I hate it when an article is full of links. Um, because again, you get that feeling that, well, I need to have clicked on all the links and read everything to really understand the topic. And wouldn't it be great if you could pay someone to click all, on all the links, read everything, decide what was important and put it in an article with no links? Well, guess what? That's what The Economist does. <laughs> I mean, now, yeah, you can, I you think can pay us to go and read all of the stuff in all the links. You know, now yeah. it does make sense. You know, if there's a if there's a in a new paper released this week, you know, the IMF has suddenly discovered, you know, life on Mars, or whatever, you might want to click on that and read it. So we do, we do have footnotes and we do occasionally link to things uh, just as a source. But, but, you know, certainly we don't pepper our articles with links to other pieces you might want to read or have those annoying links between paragraphs that are about something totally different. And we want you to just focus on reading the piece. And we design every piece to be completely self-contained, as completely comprehensive, which is why we have weird quirks like saying Ford, comma, a car maker. Because the mm -hmm. idea is that if you are a Martian who speaks English and you've just arrived on Earth, which is slightly weird, I realise, but, but um, you know, we don't presuppose that you know that Ford is a car maker. So you should be able to read that piece and understand everything. And we should give you all the information you need to understand the argument. But on yeah. the flip side, do you think there is a danger that if you present the article as everything you need to know, 
then people will kind of walk away from it. You know, in a, in a world where complexity and nuance is lost all the time, do you think that having this model, whilst there's a lot of value in it, also has its downsides? No, I think you're right. There is a risk there. And I think there is a, I think there's a good case for show you're working. Um, and, you know, increasingly journalists are showing they're working. So, um, so I think having, you know, an appendix where you have sources, maybe that's a way of doing it. But I think putting it into the body of the article, I think that's something we'll continue to try and resist because, um, because I think it is, I think it's irritating. So, for you know, maybe you do it with footnotes or you do it with some, some other way of doing it. So I totally take your point. I think we can get away with it because um, our readers trust us. Um, and, um, the, and in fact, you know, our whole model depends on the trust of our readers. They trust us to decide what's, you know, what's worth reading about that week. And, um, and that's really the service they're paying us for, which is curating, you know, managing, editing the, the week's events and then giving them, you know, our analysis of, of each one. And the whole model only works and the whole kind of, you know, I trust you to figure out what's important and tell me only works if they trust us. Um, so, you know, it's, it, you're absolutely right. If we, if we have any sort of inkling that we are, we are becoming less trusted because we are not providing that sort of information, then that would be, you know, we would have to, we would have to respond. But, um, but at the moment, I think the benefits of not covering everything with links outweigh the drawbacks of, of not doing so. And I think most of the time links are, I totally take your point, but most of the time links in articles are not about showing your working and showing your sources and supporting your evidence. Most of the time they're about trying to get you to click on more stories and right. read more yeah. stuff. And here's a slideshow and here's a video. And, um, and I'm trying to drive, you know, um, referrals to my e-commerce site over here. And so, <laughs> so, you know, that, that we are definitely not doing. Okay. You talk a lot about how important trust is and how you try to be as comprehensive as possible which kind of makes you think of a vertical line of communication to your readers, right? Um, from, from the editors, the journalists, to the public. On the other hand, you have social media, which is more horizontal. And um, you wrote a book about social media, The 2,000-Year-Old History, which is, was a very interesting book. One of the biggest changes in journalism uh, or in media right now is that in recent years, the, the, there's been a massive increase in the speed through which news can spread. It's almost instant. The former CEO of Twitter likened the, their app to um, a global town square, a, a Roman forum or a Greek agora. Uh, he said so agora, say. yes. He said yeah. he said Greek, but yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Greek agora. Would you say it's fair that with with social media we went like full circle? Yes, I mean that's kind of the argument of my book, which is that most that media was social um, for most of the history of media. So I start, in fact, with the Roman media, which is where I think you get the first ro media ecosystem. Um, I mean, to have a media ecosystem, a social media ecosystem, you need a couple of things. You need a high level of literacy. Um, and in the Roman world, it seems to have been maybe 30 percent, something like that. So, you know, there were a large number of people who could read and write. Um, and then you also need the copying and the delivery of information to be cheap and fast. And in the Roman world, that was possible because of slavery. Um, so uh, a lot of you know, rich Romans who could read and write had large numbers of slaves who were scribes, who could copy books out for them, who would deliver messages for them and so on. And that meant that for the first time it was, you know, it was quite cheap for, there's an example in one of Cicero's letters where he's, he's writing to, uh, someone's written him a letter and asked him a question on the, a point of law. And he's writing a reply to them in the middle of the reply. He says, hang on a minute, I'm just going to ask my friend so-and-so who lives on the other side of town. And he literally sends off a messenger with a wax tablet and a question on it and um, gets the answer back and then writes the answer into the letter. So that's kind of Roman text messaging. And that was possible because, of, you know, you had these very, very wealthy Roman men um, who owned slaves and could also read and write. Um, but what I then try and do is show the evolution of social media in lots of different forms. And my argument is that most people got most of their news through social forms of media uh, for most of the past 2000 years. And it's really the past 150 years that have been the aberration. And this is when we invented mass forms of media, first newspapers, then radio and television. And the thing about all of these forms of media was that they could reach much larger audiences and you could duplicate information much more quickly and send it over long distances. But um, the available bandwidth for doing that was much smaller. So a typical country would only have, you know, a, a city would have a few newspapers, a country would have a few newspapers. Uh, you, you know, when I was growing up, there were three TV channels and then there were four. 
Um, and, you know, radio has a limited amount of bandwidth. Um, so you can't have an infinite. So we can't all have our own radio stations. Funnily enough, radio was a social medium in its early days. It was kind of a free for all on the airwaves. Yeah. Um, but then it was you know, regulated and it became this m- much different thing. And so we've we've um, we have all grown up in the era of mass media um, and an era, era when there was scarcity. And, you know, there were there were this, you know, there were five nightly news broadcasts or whatever. And what the Internet has done is blown all that up. And it has taken away the monopolies that those mass media companies used to have. And they're all grumbling about it now and saying, well, Google and Facebook have stolen our lunch. And we used to get all this advertising money and now it's gone to Google and Facebook. And it rightfully belongs to us and they should compensate for us. But actually, this is a really relatively recent thing. Um, newspapers relying on advertising they only date back to the 1830s. Um, then you really have the first advertising funded model. And in fact, I've just written a piece about how the current boom in newsletters, um, so substacks and things like that, um, this is actually a reboot of, a news, of the original business model for journalism from the 1620s. Uh, and back in those days, they were called letters of news rather than newsletters. But basically, if you were, you know, um, a rich uh, nobleman in the country in England, you might pay me, a poor scribe in London, to go and collect some gossip and then send it to you as a letter. And then I might, you know, I might do this to you as a favour, but then you might say, well, a couple of my friends could do with a copy of your letter each week. Will you send them on as well? And I might charge them. Um, and uh, and so this was this became a business. Um, so my point is that we had this sort of weird period between about 1850 and about 2000, where we, we got used to the idea that media was something where you had a small number of big monopoly platforms. Um, and the Internet has blown all of that up, but it's also really taken us back to something that's much more like the world before mass media. Um, and so that's why I think it's worth looking at the way that that world worked and the way that people handle things like, um, you know, freedom of speech and uh, regulation of the press and, and so on, because it's a very, very similar situation to what we see today in a lot of ways. Uh, I think uh, historical analogies are, are really useful here, especially just in, in trying to understand the impact of this, this return really to, to our society, on our society, on our politics. Uh, how, how do you go about, you know, it's a bit one of the biggest questions that people ask, and I'm sure you've been asked it many times before. But yeah, how, how do you understand this this change this you know that we've seen over the past four or five years with Twitter? And- well, well, I think um, so. I wrote my book. Uh, my book came out in 2013 on social media, and you know, social media has moved on a bit since then. Now, most of the book, as you know, is actually about the history um, of social media. It's only the last chapter that looks at kind of the very the, uh, internet-based social media um, and the uh, the rise of blogs and and um, and that sort of thing and social media platforms like like facebook and twitter so i i'm not sure that that last chapter of the book has aged terribly well i think i was probably a bit too optimistic about two things one was that social media would be a sort of positive force for openness and transparency which it has and you look at stuff like you know what bellingcat has done that amazing video that um Navalny published, you know, about Putin's palace a, a couple of weeks ago, which is just extraordinary. Um, and it's sort of open source intelligence and all sorts of... And you you about, were writing had, in the, the time of the Arab Spring as well, which was very much yeah, exactly. a social media... So was, I mean, the Arab Spring, you know, it was t- I was writing two years after the Arab Spring had started, and it was clear that, um, you know, it was a mixed bag <laughs> at best, even then. But I think, um, you know, the, clearly the main thing that's happened is the use by authoritarian figures like Trump of social media to spread um, total misinformation, total nonsense, you know, QAnon, conspiracies, that sort of stuff. Um, And I suppose I had always assumed that um, the use of social media by individuals would be more agile and faster moving and more flexible than the use of um, social media by repressive governments, and that therefore that that would give people the upper hand. and I'm not sure that's true. I think the Chinese have done a very good job of um, suppressing any form of dissent on social media. Um, and also, if you've got an individual like Trump, who isn't, he's, a, he's technically a government figure, but he's not, you know, he wasn't really, I mean, he was basically at war with the institutions of the United States for most of his presidency. Um, and so in that sense, he was exploiting the, the disruptive power of, of social media um, to create social instability in, you know, in a way that, in a way that you know, I think it was destructive to the to the the fabric of American politics and, yeah, the, yeah. and the and the tenor of American politics. So so you know that is that's been the big problem. And then we've ended up with these arguments now about whether you ban him or not. And 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 it, and it is a very hard question for Western liberals like you know people who work at the Economist to answer because we on the one hand would say that in China we approve of the people who are trying to basically campaign against the government using social media. 
But the people doing it in America are trying to bring down a democratically elected state. They're trying to overthrow elections. And we don't approve of them. And doesn't that look like a double standard? And we would say, well, well the thing we actually approve of here is democracy and self-determination and the rule of law. And you don't have that in China. And you do have it, um, although maybe not to the extent that we'd like in America. And so therefore, you know, that's the, that's how we draw that distinction. But it is, you know, these are these are tricky times. And these are great times to be an authoritarian like Putin or Xi Jinping, because you can say, well, look, you've got censorship in the West as well. Look what look what's just happened to Donald Trump. And you've got all these Republicans now talking about the silencing. Um, but the fact is that, you know, Trump was trying to incite a, an insurrection um, using social media platforms. And, um, you know, so you can see why the social platforms took the action they did. So you think they were right? You think that... No, well, we, we don't. We don't actually. Um, the, and the economist, I, uh, you know, I don't think so personally. I think the economist view is also that um, that they went too far because they didn't really they weren't consistent with their own policies in taking Trump down. They basically took him down and then they tried to come up with a justification for it afterwards. And I think there is a there is a case. I don't think you would want to keep up all um, hate speech or, you know, there's a good case against not allowing hate speech, not allowing incitement. But there is also a case for saying that heads of state in particular, um, you know, have a have a right to be heard. And um, and it's it's tricky. Now, that said, the First Amendment does not apply to Twitter and Facebook. They are private companies. The First Amendment says that the government shall not intervene to, you know, with your right of free speech in America. It says nothing about whether private companies want to do it or not. So they're entirely within their rights to do so. But we think that they've set a rather dangerous precedent for themselves there because their rules about this are extremely inconsistent and they frankly keep changing them all the time. And it really does look like basically the CEO in each case has just said, okay, pull the plug. And if that's the way they're making the rules, then that's going to be a problem for them in the future. So they really do need to be a lot more consistent. So this this arbitrary censorship, uh, as it may, uh, of social media, as well as like the legitimacy of that, uh, isn't that one of like, is it a fundamental problem of public debate now taking form on private platforms? Um, Yes, it is. And so one of the other things that I was too optimistic about in my book on social media was that um, I I said, keep an eye on these basically open social platforms. So if you look at email and the web, they are not controlled by a single company in the way that um, Facebook controls Facebook or Twitter controls Twitter. So you can, you know, now in practice, a lot of us use, you know, Gmail and a lot of us use hosting with, say, Amazon. But um, but in, in theory, you can set up a web server in your bedroom and plug it into the internet, and you can set up a mail server and plug it into the internet, and it will work. And you can send email, and you can publish your own blog on your own server, and all the rest of it. You know, they're, that, they're open standards, HTTP and SMTP and all the rest of it. Social media isn't like that at all. It's this, it's this world of private platforms run by companies that say, you know, we control this platform, we sell advertising, we decide who's on, who's off, and so on. And that's a lot like the way the internet looked before the web went mainstream. So when I first you know, got on the internet, actually, I first used it at university, but the consumer internet began with, with these closed platforms like CompuServe and America Online. Um, and you bought everything from them and they gave you access and they gave you their own content. And then eventually they became gateways to the web and their own, their own content empire shriveled up. And, and um, so one of the points I make in the book is we, we, with Facebook and with Facebook in particular, it's kind of like a return to AOL and CompuServe. It's this weird information universe that's controlled by a private company. Um, and I, my guess was that people wouldn't go on putting up with this, that sooner or later there would be some sort of privacy breach, that some sort of open social platform would emerge and that people would flock to that. And that would be a much better state of affairs because then you wouldn't have you know, a single company or a single boss being able to call the shots. And it would also be you know, more immune to um, government censorship. And yeah, there'd be, there, you know, like there'd be, there would be various advantages to that. Also, if you had a proliferation of open platforms, you'd get more competition between them. The problem is that none of these open social platforms have gone anywhere. So I don't know if you've tried any of them, but things like Mastodon is one of them. Um, what are the others? I mean, there've been loads of them. Why, why haven't they Tim- gone anywhere? Sorry. Well, there's a, cu- a few reasons. Tim Berners-Lee is trying to start this up again as well. The way these platforms are usually imagined is that, so Mastodon is a sort of open source clone of Twitter, but you have multiple, like with Discord, you have multiple servers. Um, and I mean, it's Discord sort of works like this because you can start your own Discord server. So maybe it's maybe it's an example of that. But um, what the usual way people imagine it is that, and Tim Berners-Lee is trying to get this going as well. The creator of the web, his new project is trying to kind of 
open social media. Um, the, the idea is that you have a sort of repository of your stuff, which is maybe your blog posts and your photos and you know, the music you've recorded or whatever. And that lives in your server, which is either in your bedroom um, and you could buy an appliance that did this or more likely you would buy storage space from, you know, your ISP or from a bank or from a company that you trusted. Um, and it might even be Facebook or something like that. But basically you would have your own pot of stuff and then you would decide um, what the um, permissions were about which of those pieces of content were shared with other platforms and with other people. So you could say share a picture with a group of friends on a messaging platform or you could share a series of blog posts with the public on a blog platform. But if at any point you wanted to withdraw that information from that platform, you could pull the plug. And it's all still sitting in your private little server, your, your repository of data. So this is the model that a lot of people have been talking about for uh, kind of the nerdy people who, um, you know, who invented the original blogging platforms and who invented the web and so on. They've all sort of said, well, isn't that the way that social media should work? Now, the problem with it, um, and we did have a version of open social media in the early days of the Internet. So you'll be too young to remember any of this. But Usenet, the original kind of messaging system on the uh, on the Internet, um, was an open um, was an open series of message boards. And the problem with it was that you would typically use it once a day. You'd post a message and it would take about a day for everything to ripple around the world into all the servers and all of the. Um, and it, it, it turns out that the benefit of centralizing everything to a platform like Facebook or, or Twitter is that a single company can gather all of the posts and instantly give you the feed right up to date. You know, everything, here's a tweet from five seconds ago. Um, you cannot do that with an open platform, or at least no one has figured out a way of solving it. It's a, it's a very hard computational, you know, computer science problem. Um, and so delivering timely, in-order timelines um, of stuff is much easier if you're a centralized company. And of course, the business model makes more sense too, because then you can sell advertising against it. So I think this is why these platforms you know they're 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 just a less good experience and they've not gone anywhere so i would like to see and i hope that you know the current moment where people are reevaluating which platforms they use and some of them are going to messaging groups and you know there's suddenly a lot more interest in in, in new platforms and new ideas i would like to see um more kind of open social experimentation coming out of this but the sad fact is that you know about 15 years of experimentation in this haven't really haven't really worked the blogosphere kind of was like this too but anyway the speed, fingers crossed the speed of which you like transfer news and get it on your feed that seems a pretty important thing um and open social media hasn't figured out that problem yet but i think for i'm, I'm really not good with technology um so at making those decisions about what we wish would want to like share with others and for, for what commissions would be very hard for me well no but, you you make that decision already when you post something on facebook right you decide whether to post it or not and you decide where or you maybe you just put it in a whatsapp group with five friends and there are things that you would put in a whatsapp group with five friends or send to your mother or send to your girlfriend or whatever that you wouldn't put on facebook and there's other things that you so actually we make these decisions all the time and on facebook you can restrict a post to just some people or you can restrict an album to just some people and so you know the, the, basically the idea is that you would have those sorts of fine-grained um, decisions and every time you had a piece of content you could decide which platforms it went to and who saw it and under you know and most of the time, you'd probably just use two or three of these open platforms. But, you know, the idea is that the, the master copy of the data would be something that you owned in your repository of stuff. And if you then decided that one of these platforms was, you know, you didn't like it, the CEO did something you didn't like, or they, they you know, did something that offended you, um, if, you know, trying to take all your photos off Facebook is really hard. Trying to delete or close a Facebook account is really hard. They tell you they've closed it down and you disappear from your friend's friends list. But it's all still there. They've still got it all. And they've, you know, they've actually asked for lots of legal rights to it um, that you've probably granted them without realizing. So, you know, it's it's dealing with that kind of stuff as well, that having your own control over your own data, this is what people say, you know, would be much more elegant. But elegance and people actually wanting to use it in large numbers are not the same thing. Right. Uh, and it, it seems like... I mean, how, so how optimistic are you then? Because you wrote your book, you know, six, seven years ago, eight years ago, and you thought it was going to develop into one thing that's developed into another. It seems like a lot of the monopolies of, you know, the, the 150 time, you know, mass media time span that you were talking about have just been replaced by you know, big tech monopolies. And you know, that's the big debate that happens. So do you think that the, could, do you think there's a chance that the technology could kind of catch up with these open social media platforms? Should we think that, you know, with everything that goes on about privacy issues now um, with these companies, do you think this could actually be a viable model going into the future? Well, I hope so, but I don't think it's the only model. I think the main thing that's changed is that we have, yes, we do have these big monopolistic, you know, media platforms like 
like um, Facebook or Twitter. Um, and But we also have lots and lots of other things. I mean, we have, for example, the podcasting ecosystem. Um, now, it, it's starting to kind of balkanize, but podcasting is actually an open standard like web publishing or like email. And so, and we have seen a proliferation of podcasts. And yes, there's a very long tail of them, but there has been fantastic innovation that lots and lots of people have been able to launch podcasts. Um, and we're also, you know, I think when when people say, "Well, I'm not going to use Twitter anymore because I've been banned, or because you know I want to go and talk to my right wing friends or whatever," I think the fact that there are more of these platforms um, and people are looking at a wider range of platforms, I hope that will mean we get more innovation and more competition between platforms. And people who want to use different platforms for different things will, you know, gamers use Twitch and and uh, lots of people use Discord for all sorts of things. You know, I think there's, I you know, I'm optimistic that there's more variation and there's more competition and ultimately that's i think what we need because part of the reason that facebook and uh, facebook and, and twitter can be dangerous because when you have everyone using the same platform that gives those platforms an enormous amount of power but it also means anyone who has a very large following on those platforms has an enormous amount of power and if we had a more balkanized media system if we had more different platforms and we didn't have just like one or two platforms that basically have the whole world on them or or the lo- a large proportion of the electorate of a big country on them then that would actually be better in a lot of ways we would we would not have those sort of megaphone effects um that you have when donald trump can you know have the whole country the whole world listen to him just by sending a trump uh, just sending a tweet yeah and, and bringing it back to you know the effect of these these uh these companies and these sites on on kind of our society and our, our politics, isn't? Uh, am I understanding it right that w- when you have many different platforms, the there's much less of a contagion effect. So networks are more contained, and any kind of radicalization that goes on is is more self-contained. It doesn't spread as much as with Twitter or YouTube or something. I think there was exactly, an example exactly. from Reddit. So you get more of a sort of natural sorting of communities into into different. Um, areas you know you used to have like the photographers went on Flickr and you know so, or, or whatever but I think um, yes I mean you're starting to see that now that you are starting to see uh, particular communities using particular platforms and each one is much smaller um, you do have the concern that if you're if, you, if you've got um, what was previously public speech moving into private you know encrypted uh, channels then does that make it more difficult for law enforcement um, it does but I don't think the answer is therefore we need backdoors in, in WhatsApp or or in iMessage, because um, that causes more harm than good in other ways, because the backdoors always end up being used by the bad guys and the authoritarian governments as well. So instead, what we're seeing now, we, you know, people are talking about this, is that um, if the, you know, the the, uh, the white supremacists, supremacists are moving off Twitter and onto other platforms and moving onto, you know, messaging apps like Telegram and Signal, the law enforcement agencies are now doing their best to infiltrate those messaging groups. And that's how you keep an eye on, on people. Um, so yeah, ultimately, I think um, what I would like to see is more competition and more diversity in the kinds of platforms that are available. The latest one that people are talking about just in the last couple of weeks is Clubhouse, which has got a bit of a tech bro, you know, Silicon Valley venture capitalist shooting the breeze um, reputation, which is totally true. And it is totally full of um, Silicon Valley entrepreneurs at the moment, but they are trying to broaden it out. And it's a really interesting model because it's it's kind of like listening to the radio. Um, it's kind of like very smart talk radio with very, very you know precise channels. And so it's a bit like podcasting, but you don't have to choose the to, what you to listen to. You can just say, oh, th- these five things are on at the moment. That looks fun. And if you're going for a walk and you just want to listen to some uh, some people talking who are very smart and know about stuff, then uh, then it's great. So I think you know what I'd like, what I would like, what I hope the outcome of this current argument about the right amount of power and regulation and structure for social media, I hope that it will lead to a larger number of smaller platforms. And I think that would be better for everybody. But if you have like more diffuse like platforms, right? So there's several ones, then each one is like its own echo chamber, isn't it? Um, well, I don't know, because you get echo chambers within the big um, within the big platforms anyway, depending on, you know, things like Facebook groups and who follows who um, and so on. So, I mean, it does, yes, it's true. It would allow people to sort into groups of people who have the same views as them but they do that on the big platforms anyway so i don't think it necessarily so how, addresses how does, that how does that work actually on, 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 on facebook for example Everyone well they go into groups they go bubbles. into facebook groups um but so, isn't also the, the algorithm itself involved sort of i mean i think um the the algorithm re- recommends groups to you that you might be interested in based on your posts and also um the the algorithm facebook had the algorithm push groups to people because previously what was happening, it was it was having the algorithm push stuff that they 
would engage with, which tended to be fake news stories. So it was you know, news stories that were either made up or exaggerated. And they would get a lot of engagement because people would be angry with them, either because they'd believe the story and say, isn't it outrageous that you know Hillary Clinton has, whatever she was supposed to have done, sold nuclear weapons to, I don't know what she was supposed to do. It was all that kind of crap in 2016. And then the people who knew it was rubbish would say, why are you reading this rubbish? And so you get this, what looked to the algorithms, like fantastic engagement and, oh, look at all these people uh, having this wonderful discussion about things. Actually, they weren't. They were all just shouting at each other. Um, and so uh, Facebook decided to downgrade news um, articles, you know, publications, publishers in the algorithm and try and favour posts from members of your friends and family because these were less likely to be inflammatory and they would get it in less trouble with regulators. And so they did this big push about, it was all about communities. And as part of that, they pushed groups. And one of the things that did was that um, you end up getting radicalization happening in groups, which are not public in Facebook. I mean, they're semi-public. And that also meant that I think um, Facebook's calculation was that they would have less of a a moderation issue because you know it would sort of be happening behind closed doors but anyway certainly the algorithm the way they adjusted the algorithm was it was pushing stuff at you from your family from your friends from groups instead of from you know the wall street journal or the daily caller or the drudge report or whoever um and so that was an algorithmic effect to some extent but it, does, it does seem that the fundamental problem here which probably speaks just to a lot of kind of the human like inability to have a civil conversation is that on the one hand, you know, if you're exposed to all these different views, which I think you touched on when you, you know, when you're talking about why you're optimistic about social media, this kind of, you know, agile communication with anybody everywhere. And you'd think that exposure to diversity of ideas would be something very good for, you know, for democratic societies. But it, it hasn't done that at all. It's just led to, to chaos, really. So then the solution to that is to put everybody in same groups and, you know, you get your echo chambers. But that doesn't work either. So what's the solution? Um, well, so hang on, I'm just looking up. I, I want to get her name right. So there's a very good book <laughs> by an academic at, um, at, at Oxford. And uh, where, oh, here we are, Carissa, there she is, Carissa Veliz. Um, and she makes a really nice point about this. Um, so she talks about her book is called Privacy is Power. Um, and I don't think the economists would agree with all of it, but it's a really um, it's a really interesting set of arguments. Anyway, she makes a distinction between um, what she calls backstage and front stage arguments. Um, and she says that you you can you basically it's useful to have a um, uh, sort of front stage behavior, you know, which is observed by everyone and backstage behavior, which only a, a few other people see. Um, and she says that for healthy psychology and healthy communication, we need both front and backstage. And what's essentially been happening is that online behavior is all front stage. Um, and so um, private messaging um, allows you to have. So, so essentially everything you say can be jumped on by anyone and anyone can say they're offended by it. And uh, and so on. and So on. So that just naturally leads to, you know, um, the person who is who sees your post, who is, you know, who is most um you know, the chances that someone will see your post and be take offense and object to it are much higher. Um, and so actually having a mixture between front stage and backstage um, uh, forms of communication she thinks would be would be healthier. And having, in other words, a, a, a swing back towards more private communication and not everything being public. Because most people aren't used to living their lives in public. I mean, politicians are used to doing it. And people who engage with the media are used to the idea that they have to choose their words carefully because anything they say could be picked over and, you know, and so on and so on. Um, but now everyone is in that position. And, you know, you see this all the time. Someone who um, it, it becomes famous for some reason and someone will say, well, look, seven years ago, they said this horrible thing or they did this terrible thing. And then, you know, they, they get into all sorts of trouble about it. Now, I'm not saying they should should be allowed to say terrible things but this is a this is a, this is something that most people have not had to deal with and the platforms have been set up as if we've all had the media training of a head of state um, and um, <laughs> and in fact you know in fact we haven't so so another thing that makes the discussion so toxic is the fact that everything is public and permanent and um, that's not necessarily a good thing and so therefore having more ephemeral media platforms and having more uh, private media platforms is probably not bad for the you know the quality and the health of discourse in general I think alongside uh, social media, which we've focused on so far, and it's easy to forget, right? I think when everybody goes on about Twitter that you have like Fox News or, or other kind of more top-down media companies in the US and they, they do a lot of damage as well. Like, you know, it's it's not necessarily- Yeah, no, I, 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 to be fair, I'm not a kind of blame everything on, blame the, the ills of society on social media person. There are problems, but there are, 
I mean, the real problem here is, is white supremacy, um, <laughs> right? Or the fact that the Republican Party is just lying to its voters. Um, these are much bigger problems. And you can, you can say, well, let's haul Mark Zuckerberg into, um, you know, into the Capitol and have him, you know, and let's, 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 let's sue the company, let's break them up. That's not going to fix the problem of white supremacy. So, you know, the, the part of the reason that this is so toxic is that underlying social ill, or the fact that America hasn't, you know, grappled with the, its history of racial inequality, and so on, and so on. So those, are, there are underlying social ills that, t- that, um, that social media, I describe it in, in the book as an accelerant, um, and so, you know, it doesn't cause revolutions, but if you've got a social movement happening, social media can throw fuel on the fire. It can be an accelerant. And I still I still think with that. I, I, I still you know, think that's the right way of, of thinking about it. So, yeah, I don't blame, um, you know, America's problems on social media. I just think social media has amplified them and made them worse and made them more apparent. And America has deep seated problems in it that it needs to deal with. And Fox News is, you know, similarly exacerbating those Divisions as well, but I definitely don't want to fall into the trap of, um, of blaming technology because most of my books about the history of technology are pointing out the error of that kind of moral panic. You know, people thought novels were were a terrible influence on yeah. people because novels. You know, people would just go into a novel for hours and read. And it was like they were in another world and they were zombies and they'd forget to eat and they wouldn't, you know, answer <laughs> when you spoke to them. All the things people say about video games today, yeah. people said about novels yeah. in the. 18th yeah. century um and then similarly you know um but people said this about video games in the 80s it was all going to make us into crazed murderers and you know and that kind of stuff and then people said this you know pretty much everything um writing writing was terrible because people wouldn't learn to remember anything that was uh plato uh so so i'm definitely not going to blame um uh and the telegraph was terrible because <laughs> you know the telegraph was blamed for all sorts of things um telegraphic divorces and and, uh, and telegraphic demoralization um so you know i'm i'm, I'm not i'm not demonizing a technology and i'm not going to say the social ills that arise are the result of the technology technologies are tools that we use and they tend to amplify aspects of human nature um they don't actually change human nature itself i don't think and let's talk about like technology itself and like step away from from journalism and, and move on to the next topic um yeah it works okay. for me great yeah it's it's easy to talk about this this stuff for hours but we do have one more section um technology in society and uh, the economist has written multiple pieces about this kind of roaring 20s and the technological optimism abound um kind of moving out hopefully eventually um from from this pan- pandemic simply what are the what are the technological developments that excite you most going into the next 10 years Ah, good question. Um, so yes, the I think the um, the prevailing mood with just the the, the context for this is that pre- the prevailing mood has been of, of gloom. So the last ten years, we kind of thought that smartphones were going to be great because they extended internet access to the whole world, which they did and has been fantastic. Uh, but social media seems to have caused more harm than good. And so the two big technologies that I think we've really noticed the most in the past ten years have both sort of seemed to make things worse, right? Because uh, we worry about people spending too much time on their phones and we worry about the toxic effects of social media. So I think that has kind of tarnished the reputation of technology to make life better rather than make it worse. And we've seen this before, you know, this famously happened in the 20th century. The Victorians are really optimistic about technology. It's great. They've got steam power. They've got telegraphs. They've invented cars. And then the First World War comes along and reminds you that technology is also really good at killing people in very, very large numbers. Um, and so you get this sort of, um, you know, pessimism about technology. And then you get the same again after the Second World War and then the environmental movement and, you know, the, and so on and so on. So we get this sort of cycle of optimism and pessimism about technology. And what we're calling there is we think that we're due for another cycle of optimism. Um, partly it's due directly to things that, um, uh, related to the pandemic. So the development of the vaccine in less than a year, these vaccines, there's many of them, but the two in particular, the Moderna and the Pfizer ones, the Pfizer-BioNTech ones, um, they use a new technology that has never been used in vaccine production before. It really is incredible. It's much more like software. And in fact, there's a brilliant blog post uh, that explains the basically the source code of the, uh, the Pfizer vaccine. Um, essentially, it's the code from the virus itself that codes for the Uh, the spike protein and in order to get a piece of code to run you kind of have to wrap it up on a on most systems you know you have to wrap it up you have to have a header and you have to you know it has to conform to certain things in order to be an executable binary and it's the same with with vaccines and so they take a piece of the code from the virus and they they 
wrap it up. And they did this in a matter of days after having the source code, the um, the DNA sequence of the, the virus last January. And then, of course, they had to actually test it. And so that's what took the time. But they were able to get this going very quickly. Um, so this, this new virus technology, which essentially is more like software than anything else, uh, is amazingly powerful. And there is huge optimism that as well as helping us get on top of the pandemic this year, it could be used to treat all sorts of other diseases. Um, and so, and, and I think this is also the, the vaccine, um, you know, there's the potential for the vaccine to remind people of the benefits of science, of international collaboration, of of relying on things like facts and evidence and, and so on. Now, it could also go the other way. The, um, the, the virus rollout, the vaccine rollout could be a disaster. People could, you know, could say that they don't trust the the uh, the vaccine. People so people are saying this now. Um, I think attitudes will change when you know. In order to go to a football game or go to a pub, you need to have been vaccinated. Mm. And when people can see that the their friends have been vaccinated, <laughs> well, when when if when people can see their friends who have been vaccinated can go on holiday and go to a football game and go to the pub, and they're like, "Well, I don't trust it because Bill Gates is going to put five G in my brain or whatever." Um, I think that's going to change minds, and um, there is some evidence of that already. So. Um, so I hope that this will be a, be a triumph there. But just generally, there are there are other technologies um, floating around that are uh, that I'm optimistic about. AI is a, is another one. Now again, we f- tend to focus on the negative sides of AI for the last ten years. We've worried about its use in algorithms. AI is itself a terribly unhelpful term. It doesn't really. It refers to a kind of very large number of technologies. That, um, it, we should really be calling it machine learning. Um, or deep learning. Um, but we've there have been some uh, very, very, and obviously there are problems with it, like, you know, racial discrimination in facial recognition systems, algorithmic bias, and so on. Again, those are reflections of the data that the system is trained on. Uh, and they are an example of technology amplifying an existing societal problem. Um, and obviously, that has to be tackled. But um, the great promise that uh, that these new technologies that machine learning brings, and this is what Demis Hassanis is working on at DeepMind, is essentially using AI, deep learning in particular, as a supercharged kind of research assistant for scientists. So there have been some very interesting papers where, well, his, his company has done this amazing thing called AlphaFold. So they're most famous for writing, you know, building AI systems that play games very well. But they've built this system that can uh, predict the shape of a protein from its de- from its um, uh, amino acid sequence. Uh, and that's an amazingly big deal. You could use that in drug discovery. People have been trying to solve that problem for, for decades. Is that that's um, separate from the, the medical innovation with the virus? That's separate. Yeah, so this yeah. is that if I give you the um, the sequence of a uh, so a, a protein um, shape determines its function and what it does, and if I and a protein is uniquely determined by the amino acid sequence. So so again, it's like software. If I give you the amino acid sequence, um, you put that into a bioprinter, it'll print out that sequence, and then it will the protein will fold itself into a particular shape. Um, We've never been able to predict what that shape is, but if we could predict it, then we could say, well, we need a protein that's this shape, or or uh, we know that this receptor is this shape, and so this one would be able to interact with it because it's this shape. So if we could predict, if we could map the the way that the source code of a protein looks onto the shape of a protein, then we could do all sorts of useful things um, in bioengineering, in in uh, in medicine, and so on. Um, that's what you know. That there's been this enormous leap forward um, using machine learning to to predict it. Um, another example is there have been systems that read lots and lots of scientific papers because there's more scientific papers than anyone could read. So you have them read a whole load of papers, thousands of papers on superconductivity, say, and they notice that you get, um, you know, researchers seem to when they use these compounds. Um, they get these effects, and when they use these compounds, they get these effects. This is entirely a linguistic analysis, but these systems can generate hypotheses that you can then test, which is try mixing this with this, and you may get this. Um, That's incredible. So, yeah. so the, and similarly, in material science, so that would help with material science in particular. And we're going to need new materials to beat climate change. Uh, we could also use bioengineered plants. That would be pretty cool as well. So we could bioengineer our crop plants so that they have corkier roots, and that every year, all the rice and wheat and everything else we grow sequesters carbon in the roots. And then we use no-till agriculture. We leave the carbon in the ground. And if you did that, um, you know, such a large proportion of the Earth's surface is growing crops. You could use it as a massive carbon sink. Um, similarly, we probably need to build machines that suck carbon dioxide out of the air directly. We're going to need new materials that are better sponges for carbon dioxide than we have now. But if you've got AIs that can predict things you might want to try and help you develop them, then that could accelerate the, the progress in that field. So um, so I think um, machine learning is very, very promising as a way of just accelerating science generally and helping us solve these big, difficult problems that we have, whether it's fighting disease or 
um, or dealing with climate change. Yeah. So that's something I'm really optimistic about. And uh, part of the reason is also that I went to university in the 80s to study AI, because that's what I wanted to do. I'd read loads of science fiction, and AI didn't work in the late 80s. <laughs> so I, I, that, that turned out not to be a career that I could really pursue. So I went into journalism instead. Now they're coming together. <laughs> exactly. So it's, uh, for me, it's great. It's, and it's interesting to talk to people in that field and write about it and see how it's how it's changed and what how it's all moved on since I I studied it. And then the other one I would highlight is I'm particularly into VR and AR at the moment. And VR seems to be having a, um, basically people have, may have discovered the killer app for VR, which is fitness. Um, so if you're stuck indoors and you want to do some exercise um, I, and you love gaming like I do, then it's absolutely brilliant if you can turn playing a game into half, for half an hour into a absolutely exhausting, sweaty workout, which you can. Um, and uh, so I think VR is having a, a, a bit of a renaissance now and augmented reality that comes after it is, I think, in the longer term, it's the next interface after smartphones. Um, so I would be keeping an eye on that in the 2020s as well. Well, talking about uh, AI, you said when you studied it, it was like science fiction and now it really works. But AI is kind of like a, a, an all-purpose or a general-purpose uh, product, right? But we haven't really discovered all the, 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 the things we can use it for. We can operationalize it in so many different things, but we haven't really fully... No, no, it's a general, you're right. I think it is a general purpose technology. So you can apply it to everything like you can apply electricity to everything. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so I think, and, and the things, a lot of what is called AI today isn't really AI anyway. Um, so, so there's a lot of kind of, uh, it's a very widely abused term. It was very interesting. Apple's most recent um, announcements of some of their new products, um, they didn't use the term AI at all. They talked about machine learning. Uh, and they do use machine learning in their products. And, you know, it's really clever stuff that, you know, Google Translate and so on and so on and so on. Um, it is more correctly machine learning because 95% of the AI products we see now are, are in fact, supervised deep learning. Um, and so I, I think it, there may be a backlash against the term AI and a, a shift towards more accurate use of terminology like like deep learning, which I think I, I would personally approve of because I think AI is a is a confusing and and uh, uh, an abused term. We hear, um, you know, we hear kind of a lot about, you know, technological development and um, robots taking over jobs and automation and AI and all these different things. It feels like we've been having this conversation forever, and it's never, you know, it's never quite materialized. Um, you know, I'm sure at the moment there are probably three and a half million truckers in the U.S. watching this, worried that Elon Musk is going to take their job with. Tesla's self-driving truck and you know, all sorts of worries about... Um, Again, well, I think history could be a guide about. to that as well, because every every single time in the past that people have said that machines will take jobs, they've been wrong. Um, machines don't take, take jobs, they change jobs. Um, so the end of the, the, the 19th century, the century in which weaving was automated, there were more weavers than there were at the beginning. Um, and, you know, companies that... that, that buy more robots, end up hiring more people because they grow faster than companies that don't buy more robots. Um, so what, what automation seems to do is, um, is basically make people more productive. And um, you know, there are loads and loads of examples of this. But, but the, only certain people, right? That's the problem. Um, no, it's actually been, well, uh, the, just before the pandemic, because obviously the pandemic has changed the uh, employment figures quite a lot. Before the pandemic, employment in the OECD countries was at record highs, right? So the so if the robots are taking the jobs, I don't know who's they're taking because um, you know basically we've been as close to full employment as we've ever been in many of those countries. Um, so I just I I don't know where the um, the people whose jobs are being taken away by this current lot of technology. It's always the next technology that people are worried about. So the self driving lorries. Oh, well, that's the technology that's going to take away all the all the jobs. But is that is that true? I mean, if um, um, being a, lo a lorry driver is not a very nice job because you're away from your family for several days at a time. If you could automate the long distance parts of it on the highways, which is probably where you automate uh, lorry driving first, because it's a much simpler environment, then you actually make a much more pleasant job of moving the stuff from the end of the highway to the depot. Also, you may have noticed there's been an explosion of employment in delivery drivers, last mile delivery drivers. Um, so I think the the unpleasant job of being away from your family for three or four days and living in a truck may may go away. But I think we're going to have an awful lot more local delivery drivers. We're also going to have jobs created to maintain you know, delivery robots. To, 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 there are already the people building self-driving cars. They have these control centers where a single uh, safety supervisor is, is looking after 12 vehicles at once. And one of them gets to a roadblock and there's a, you know, there's a roadwork or something like that. And they have to say, 
they have to draw with a pen, you know, this is the path you should take around it. So the, the, uh, this is what technology has always done. It has changed the job to a different kind of job. Um, and so, you know, you, we may move from drivers to supervisors of drivers, or we may move from lorry drivers to, um, you know, to local drivers or, or something like that. Um, but no, I think the, the, the lesson of history is that the idea that the robots are really going to take all the jobs away um, has just always been wrong. So I don't see any reason for it not to be wrong again. Well, I mean, like, I, I understand that argument and you look to, to history and that's what it says. But well, so, so a lot of people have argued recently that um, a lot of the technological developments that we've seen in the past aren't really going to be repeated. Um, so you have, you know, Robert Gordon, the economist. Yeah, no, so the Robert Gordon, the they're, they're, all the good things have been invented. Again, I just, I completely disagree with that. Um, I think the problem is that, um, and people thought this, so the Luddites thought this in the 1820s. They thought, oh God, um, machines are going to take our jobs as weavers. And, you know, what are we going to do? This is what, in, historically, we look back at that period and we go, this is just before the steam engine is invented, invented and there's an explosion in railways. This is just before the telegraph is invented. And there's an explosion in telecommunications. This is just before electrification begins. And that has an enormous impact on industry. So there were three technological revolutions around the corner that they, they of course, couldn't have known about. Um, and, and we have some inkling of the technological revolutions that could happen this century. We're seeing the beginnings of one in, in, in clean tech. Tech, for example, but you know we haven't even started on um, on synthetic biology. Uh, we're we're still absolutely kind of kindergarten when it comes. To, and now the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine are kind of the beginnings of how you could use our understanding of biology as a as a branch of engineering. Um, but we haven't. You know, by the end of this century, people will have things like you know buildings that grow themselves, um, or uh, car parts or uh, machinery parts that grow back when they wear. Um, this is stuff that's in science fiction, by the way, but um, but it's entirely plausible by just extrapolating from existing synthetic biology. So, of course, you know, we look back at all the things that have been invented and go, well, we can't think of anything that um, needs to be invented or can be invented. So we must be at the end of the history of technology. But um, I'm sure there's much more to come. And there... space, we're just getting going with space as well. We're right at the beginning of so many enormous changes. <laughs> and at this end of this century, we'll just look back and go, well, there you go, roaring 20s. <laughs> the start of it all but i guess yeah. my point then do you think that there is a link between the the gravity of the technological innovation like i think that you know i agree that robert gordon is wrong and that okay you could say for the past 10 years with social media or with phones it's 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 been a bit you know it's been a bit of a, a whimper rather than a big shout um and they haven't really had the big effect that they were going well, to they haven't, they haven't had any impact on I, I suppose the problem is that where economists like to look for the impact of technology is in productivity and the technologies that we've been most excited by in the past 10 years which have been smartphones and, and social media have actually had a negative effect on on productivity if anything they're very efficient ways to waste time um which is great and that's really you know they're entertaining and you can play a game while waiting for a bus for for two minutes which you couldn't do in the 1980s because playing a game meant plugging something into your tv and you know being sitting on the floor um so but i mean I, i'm not surprised that um those technologies have not shown up in uh, in productivity figures because i don't think they i don't think they actually make much of an impact but i think big industrial technologies like um synthetic biology or, 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 you know, space technologies, I think could really make a massive difference to economic productivity. So, um, so I don't, I don't think the game is over at all. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens in the next 50 years, which I intend to stick around for as much of as I possibly can. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there, yeah, I think, I think I, I have pretty much an information overload. Right now. <laughs> and, and are, I mean, it's cool. nice to have such an optimistic interview, right? Yeah. It feels like, yeah, maybe some people will think you're too too optimistic about the power of technology and you know be more concerned. But it's it's always nice to hear. But a, I think this is, I like voice. to think that mine is is a a pragmatic um, position, but it's also informed by history, which is we know that in the past people have been gloomy about technology. We also know in the past they've been too optimistic about technology. And I think if you have that kind of historical um, reference point, then you can sort of try and get yourself somewhere in the middle where you yeah. say it's probably not as bad as people say. Um, but it's probably also, you know, immortality and we all upload ourselves into the, you know, that's probably all nonsense as well. But somewhere in the middle, there is a sensible position to take. And the other thing is that, you know, the fact is for the past certainly 500 years, technology has made people's lives better. Um, and I don't see any reason for that um, progress with a capital P not to continue.
thank you very much for your time today. I really okay. enjoyed it. I think James did too. Yeah, unfortunately, that's all we all we have time for. But uh, yeah, yeah, no, really enjoyed it. Nice to get a, a forward to to forward thank looking voice, but also backward looking. It's a really nice mix. Um, and thank you for such insightful. smart questions as well, and and, uh, and a variety of, of of subjects. Much appreciated. <laughs> Thanks very much, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Bye bye. You too. Bye.